Hi there, my name's Nicholas Bamington. I'm a futurist. I help my clients look out 5, 10, 20 plus years into the future so they can do better strategic planning today, anticipate risks, and form bigger visions of the futures that lay ahead of us. Now, this presentation is called Exponential Industry. I'm incredibly excited to speak with you all about some signals and some changes and some of the things that I think are going to change our world of work as mechanical contractors. Now, where did I start my career? Well, I started at a very young age, at eight years old. My father gave me a couple of books about the future uh, published by Osborne. So the Osborne book of the future was really formative for me. It showed me a world in the year 2000 and it was purely speculative. And this is the mid 70s. So there was lots of lunar bases and sea, sea floor mining and futuristic cities and wearables and flying cars and things like that. And whilst these things haven't necessarily come to pass, there's a lot of technology that's starting to push us forward to think bigger about how the world can be. And that was a really early start for me to start wondering, you know, what if the world was different? And when I work with uh, executives and people in associations and the such like, I really push them to change their mindsets and, and to break out the idea that we're stuck in this like, what is mindset? What do we have to do today? What do we have to do in the next couple of months? And focusing in on that. Whilst that's important, it's equally as important today to wonder what if and to be creative and start to wonder, okay, five, 10, 20 plus years, what's the world gonna be like? How can we prepare now for that future? And what I like to do as part of my presentations is take us back a little bit and look at the history of the industrial revolutions that have been before us. So these industrial revolutions have been defined by three dimensions, and that's the dimensions of communications, energy, and transportation. And 280, 290 years ago, it was innovations in these three areas that are driving us forward and really created the modern world and, and how we live in a civilization with technology as we see it today. But now we're in something called the fourth industrial revolution. Communications happen faster than ever before through social media and internet-based communications. Uh, we've got energy that's renewable and we're starting to push our way forward with that. I'll talk a little bit more about that in this keynote. And transportation as well, electrified transportation, autonomous transportation, and all of these three areas have got innovations in them that's all connected by the internet and data is the lifeblood of this future. But really, what we found at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, was we were pushed into a world that sort of halted a little bit. And whilst we're starting to get back into this sort of a new normal, as some people call it, we've seen the, the COVID-19 pandemic really shake everything from, you know, working in offices to kids in schools to the transportation we take and global logistics as well. And we've certainly felt that in the mechanical contractors business as well. And obviously the clients that we work with are the clients that their, their, their struggles are our struggles. So we all we're all working together to get out of that pandemic. So this keynote is about highlighting some signals of change. These are things that show me that the world is going to be different in the future. It's some evidence from today, whether it's from research and development, small implementations and proof of concepts, or academic literature and, and speculations on the future. And I'm gonna take you through some of these. And I always start in a really important area. And that really important area is about climate and energy. So let's take a look. And today we find ourselves in the Anthropocene, which is the current geological age viewed as the period during which human activity and the things that we do has been the dominant influence on climate and the environment. And um, we've probably seen this uh, phrase used in a number of different movies and uh, articles that we've read. But now we can really see that human activity over the last 280, 300 years in the industrial age has sort of caused us to be in the, the predicament that we're in today. 
and that predicament is a reliance on fossil fuels and the CO2 which is being pumped into the atmosphere. Now we've seen a, an evolution since 1800 of our energy system and now we're starting to move towards a new world where we've got solar wind, nuclear hydro, geothermal and other renewable energy sources starting to take the fore in terms of opportunity to remove the ideas of natural gas, oil and coal out of the ecosystem of energy globally. And what we found as well is that, that modern reports from the IPCC are, t are telling us that the original targets of 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, global warming to, to maintain a level of normality is, is already being smashed and we're heading to you know two degrees plus and we're going to get warmer over time. I think 2021 has been the year where we've seen really calamitous problems globally uh, for all of us and I'm pretty sure that everyone watching has, has felt this in some way. Now the United States Army War College uh, released a really important paper called The Implications of Climate Change for the US Army a couple of years ago. I use this as a reference. It's pretty difficult to refute what the US Army says. And they're expecting more frequent extreme weather events and we've seen that. Rising seas and population migration. Not quite seen them yet but that will come. Decrease in Arctic sea ice and conflict over natural resources. Well there's already evidence and signals around saying that that is happening. And drought and warming will put an increased strain on the US power grid and certainly in 2021 we've seen some evidence of that as well. In fact I think that 2021 is a preview for the next 10 years and I think that we should all be concerned in, in our trade as well as the trades and the businesses that we work with uh, about the changes that we're going to have to go through to create resiliency to survive in, in a world that's going to be drier in some parts and wetter in other parts and calamitous in both places as well. And now we've got an economy globally, I think, it, that's going to be defined in the next 20 years by access to water, the ability to grow food and distribute that, and the ability to create energy and distribute that very cheaply around the world using renewable energy sources. So we're kind of finding us in a position where we have to face up to the reality that we've got four futures ahead of us. Do we continue where we are? Do we think about the limits and discipline that lay ahead of us and, and try and break through them? Do we let the world collapse? And many people are saying that we're on a constant trajectory of collapse and have been since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. It's an interesting thought. But really, I think that we're more resilient than that. We're smarter. We come together and we ultimately try and come out of that decline into transformation. And this is a model that's been put forward by a very famous futurist called Jim Data or out of the University of Hawaii. And we use this as a model to start really exploring, you know, what if the world was different? What if we take certain actions? And what if we create stories and narratives about the future that can tell us that the world could be different and then put strategic plans in place today? Okay, so from climate, I think we need to get into power and energy and how that's going to change as well. Indeed, we're seeing an age of power shifts. In fact, people are saying that 86% of our global energy demand could be met by renewable energy by 2050. And we have to make these choices today to move into that future. In fact, Carl Burkhart has done some research and he's looked at if like 136, 140 different countries around the world got together to eradicate the usage of fossil fuels, we could head into a world where we've got more of a reliance on onshore and offshore wind, utility scale solar, rooftop photovoltaics, so the ability to put solar on, uh, on the rooftops of where we live and where we work, independently of the grid, and also with hydro and geothermal. I'm going to talk a little bit more about geothermal in a few minutes. And we've already seen some examples around the world of some pretty incredible uh, constructions that have really uh, changed the landscape of energy. So in southern Australia, they had some problems with energy uh, provision and they, they started to build out the Hornsdale wind farm but were having uh, trouble with the consistency. So there was a conversation online between a couple of billionaires, Elon Musk and, uh, and one of the, uh, the founders of a company called Atlassian in Australia and the government and Elon Musk said, 
in a hundred less than a hundred days, we will build you uh, the world's largest uh, battery farm and help solve your problems. And they did it in eighty six days. It was fifty million dollars, and it was about a ninety million uh, dollar Australian dollar project. And they paid it off within about three years. There's still challenges running the, these these infrastructure and to keep them up to date, and also to keep that consistently uh, running in a way that provides resiliency. But projects like this are hugely inspirational to me, and I'm pretty sure that um, you, you've seen a number of other examples around the world as well. Then I look to cities like New York, where there's really creative people getting together in smaller communities to create things like micro energy grids. So uh, rooftop photovoltaic cells that, that are traded between places. So you can remain independent of the energy grid, have cheap to almost free energy, and you can push the rest of the energy that you don't use into the grid and even earn money as well. I really think that this is the future of solar, not, not centralized solar and battery farms. I do think that this is something that we can see happening across North America and the world and will actually change that landscape quite drastically. And I look out to Holland and amazing implementations of, of multiple kinds of technologies around uh, um, saving water, growing food and sharing energy. And this is uh, Die Aderhusen. And this is a small community of earth ships that actually generate their own energy, grow their own food. Uh, they, they look after their own water sources and share them amongst the community as well. And I do think that we're going to see some of these micro communities going forward. In fact, I think that some of the larger clients that we serve are going to be acting like these micro communities as well and I think that you'll even see employees working for these companies like Amazon and Microsoft Google Apple and whatever in very very close proximity in places in a similar architecture to this and then I think it's really exciting to think about how we can have mixed use land as well uh, projects and this is a project out in out in Germany uh, are starting to look at agrovoltaics so you can grow your food in the fields but above those fields you can harvest the energy from the sun with solar so that's really exciting to me as well I also speak to a lot of people in the agriculture and food industry uh, every single year. It's a very exciting place to be because there's a huge amount of innovation. In fact, agriculture has been the birth of modern civilization and the big cities couldn't have survived with, without growing food on bulk. So things like anaerobic digesters uh, that fuels a farm entirely and puts 90% of energy back into the grid are really revolutionizing these industries that really need a helping hand in actually optimizing um, how they use energy and how they make money as well. And all of these technologies I'm talking about, there's a huge opportunity for mechanical contractors. And, and whilst we, we may not delve and deal with clients in these aspects of energy today, I certainly think that going forward, uh, that will become part of what we do. But what about geothermal? So when I was chatting to, to the team at uh, 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 the MCA WW, they were saying, you know, what about geothermal? We've got questions, you know, like this is pipe work, this is what we do. Well, I took a look down in and, and across North America, there's a huge opportunity for geothermal as well. If we can tap into geothermal, then we can tap into the opportunity to create steam and create energy in a way that's sustainable. And think about all those jobs and the people that could dig oil wells. Well, you can actually tap into geothermal um, steam and, and water, water resources across the states as well. But if we dig down a little bit more and look into Washington State itself, we can see that it's fairly uh, scarce uh, in terms of opportunity of where we can tap into geothermal. So whilst we can look at the Yakima Fold Belt and the Pelusi Slope, it, it's a real challenge to start to bring that up to the larger conurbations of like Spokane or places like Seattle as, and Tacoma as well. So, you know, we can't really rely on geothermal being a major part of our business, I think, and I speculate about Washington State, but it's been really interesting to look into that and to look at the strategies behind that. And there's a link there to the government website where you can read a little bit more. But I do think that the global energy uh, solution that we need to look at is around global energy supergrids. It's the idea that you can generate renewable energy very cheaply, if not for free, and you can distribute that around the world. 
the money that we pay for energy is going to be the money of distribution and, and accepting that into our homes and our businesses as well. In fact, we've already seen some initiatives happening um, in Asia across five different countries. We've seen it in, in the North Atlantic, across Scandinavia and the UK and, and into mainland Europe as well. And I do think that this is going to cause a major political turmoil, especially because North America could get very sort of isolated from the rest of the world here. So this is going to be a really interesting geopolitical conundrum to watch over the next few years and remember we're talking about the, the water food energy nexus so those three things on the geopolitical stage are going to all be interplaying between each other okay let's think about electrification so once we've got this energy and once we've got access to, to batteries and they get better at storing energy and they get cheaper you know how's that going to change how we do certain things so one thing we need to consider is electric vehicles. And there's estimates saying that 18.7 million EVs will be on the US roads by 2030. It could actually be more. I think there's going to be a bigger uptake, especially with infrastructure uh, for charging being put in place and ultimately uh, more electric vehicles being put onto the roads. They're just better solutions. I've been driving an electric vehicle for three years and I've spent almost nothing on, uh, on maintenance fees uh, for that vehicle except for changing tyres once a year. I live in Ontario. It gets very wintry here, so I need to do that. And also windscreen washer fluid. So uh, there's not much that I have to do, but I do think that there's going to be incredible growth in the vehicles that we drive and that we interact with. In fact, if you look at this on an industrial scale, we're starting to see uh, ele electrified uh, semis, and this is uh, Walmart's uh, uh, usage of the Tesla semi. And, and you've got um, you've got boats, uh, el electrified uh, car ferries, and that's in Norway, where they've got a huge amount of electrification happening right now. The bottom left-hand corner here is a, a, a large container ship that goes up and down the Yangtze every day, about 40 miles up and 40 miles down. It takes cargo, ironically, it takes uh, it takes coal up and down the Yangtze as well and so that actually takes about four hours to unload and also four hours to charge uh, so it, it's a pretty sustainable way of doing that and also if you look at out further in China you're seeing tens of thousands of buses being put into cities every sort of uh, six to eight weeks right now and they're really going deep on, on electrification across their entire country and they know that if they can generate that solar energy and they can distribute that efficiently that that's going to be the future because they don't want to be reliant on fossil fuels which uh, which they have been to this point beyond climate and energy i like to talk about sensors because that's at the sharp end of the collection of data the optimization of systems and helping us operate in ways that are much more efficient now it's interesting all of the systems you're going to be touching are going to have sensors in them if not today they certainly are in the next few years and in fact you've got people data and things coming together like like never before so person to machine interfaces person to person interfaces that utilize these things to connect us and also machine to machine automated interfaces as well and these net, net networks platforms and devices are going to become incredibly important for us to master in fact, we, we're heading into a trillion sensor economy. By the end of last year, they, they assumed that we're going to have about 50 million uh, smart things in the world. And those smart things could have multiple sensors as well. If you look at the smartphone in your pocket, that thing is ultimately tracking you, capturing your information and thousands of interactions per day of you in person and your virtual self as well. So, so this is becoming an ecosystem that's incredibly important to understand in the world of business and in in our jobs as mechanical contractors as well and why because it covers everything that we're likely to touch homes and cities and energies transportation businesses and beyond all of these things are going to have sensors and this can be a really really good thing but we also need to be aware of security we need to be aware of the ability to understand what that data is and it's going to be asked on us a lot more about understanding that data and being data literate and potentially being code literate as well so thinking about things and sensors and the Internet of Things really pushes us into the realm of thinking about smarter cities where those, those sensors are embedded and ultimately we create programmable environments. So when we think about smarter cities, we have to consider all of the elements that, that fit inside of that ecosystem. Everything from uh, the energy uh, coming from offshore and, and on land, smart houses, EV car sharing, 
uh, application platforms, biomass fuels, uh, mega solar plants, battery storage systems, and beyond. And also sensors embedded in the roads and the systems and the lighting and the water systems that keep everything running smoothly. In fact, the smart cities market is exploding and worldwide the smart cities market will grow from its current $622 billion in size to $3.48 trillion in size in the next five years. There's a lot of big money going into this because we're trying to modernize our cities, we're trying to modernize the buildings within them as well, and we're trying to really gain some efficiencies. And one particular city I like to talk about is Barcelona. It's beautiful and historic, and a few years ago, the mayor got together and formed 12 different disciplines within the local government to work out how they can utilize technology and smart systems to really help them with a number of different solutions to optimize and help them save money. So they save $95 million annually through smart lighting and water management when they turn their systems on. They increase parking revenues by $50 million per year. I basically think that their, their parking uh, revenue strategy was non-existent before that. But what was really interesting was that they generated 47,000 new jobs. We need people like you. And we need people that, that we work with to help maintain these systems and build out new infrastructure. And then to maintain that and really ensure that all of this is working in a way that benefits everyone that lives in the city. And now today, when you look at Barcelona, you see so many things across security and utilities, mobility, healthcare, economic development, housing and engagement really coming together driven by sensors, collecting data, using smart systems in the back end, and people that are smart really understanding what that data means and implementing new initiatives to save these cities more money. And also we can look at specific buildings as well. This is Deloitte's building called The Edge, and this again is in Holland, uh, really modern, the use of sensors and modern HVAC systems and the such like. Uh, this is a building that's run through a dashboard. It's run by centralized systems. It doesn't have enough seats for all of the employees. Well, not all of the employees are actually uh, going there when uh, life returns back to normal. So uh, that was good foresight and planning by them. But the ability to use all of these systems and data to be able to control how that building operates is going to be the de facto standard for everyone. So the larger clients that we're dealing with are already starting to do this and the smaller buildings that need to transform to sort of meet the new demands of you know growing temperatures in the summer and colder winters and wetter winters as well are going to have to start looking at some of these smart devices embedded within their infrastructure. It's really interesting when I started doing the research and looking at the industry and starting to think about you know opportunities out there. The global atmospheric water generation market is, is booming, $11 billion in size by 2026, which is a growth, a compound annual growth rate of 30% from 2020 to 2027. That's, that's more than healthy. That's really, really good. So things like atmospheric water generators are going to be coming into the infrastructures that we're working in and as water shortages are going to get more, uh, more prevalent over the next few years. Uh, this is going to really be boom time. We're going to be working on a lot of these. And also when we look at HVAC and air conditioning installations, uh, we're, we're also assuming that they're going to they're gonna skyrocket as well. And whilst we're going to see that in the United States, places like India and China is going to be boom time and the rest of the world as well. So, so that's going to become an even more essential part of our job. And there's going to be more mechanical contractors out there. Your companies are going to grow. It's going to be really good. But it's also going to need a lot of specialization a lot of careful listening and the understanding, you know, sensors and data is going to be part of that ecosystem. Now, I travel often down to San Francisco, or I certainly did travel often down to San Francisco uh, before the pandemic, and uh, the Salesforce Tower was built over there. It's the tallest building in San Francisco. It's got 61 floors and it's just over a thousand feet tall. And it's, what's really interesting to me is it's got the largest on-site water recycling black system in commercial high-rise building in the United States. And they're targeting to save about 7.8 
million gallons of water per year. And they do that by collecting water from rooftop rainwater systems. They, they, they use that water internally and they process that in their black water systems. They've got cooling towers, showers, sinks, and toilets and treating it. And they treat this water in a centralized treatment center for reuse, which is really good for the city of San Francisco and ultimately saves Salesforce a lot of money. That water that they, they save will be repurposed for systems like toilet and drip irrigation systems within the building as well. They become really self-sustaining. Another technology that I'm really excited about in uh, urban planning and infrastructure is the idea of a sponge city. A sponge city manages stormwater through increased filtration, detention, storage, treatment, and drainage. And if you implement this concept, the impact of urban development on water-related problems in natural ecosystems is diminished. And some of the benefits are, you know, having more clean water for the city, cleaner groundwater due to the increased volume of naturally filtered stormwater, a reduction in flood risk, which is going to become incredibly important, lower burdens on drainage systems, water treatment plants, artificial channels and natural streams, a, a greener, healthier, more enjoyable urban spaces, and this attracts people to the cities and places that we live and an enriched biodiversity as well. Uh, again, we're seeing a lot of sponge cities happen across Europe and, and also in China as well. Uh, less so in North America, but I certainly think that there's going to be some huge opportunities, especially in the Pacific Northwest where it certainly rains a lot. I used to live in uh, Vancouver, BC. I certainly know uh, the conundrum of, of living in a place so beautiful but so uh, uh, verdant and green because of the amount of water that drops out of the sky. But I do like to look into the past to look into the future as well. And, you know, thinking about uh, wind towers and uh, wind catchers and ancient technologies for passive cooling is hugely interesting to me. You know, in the Pacific Northwest, it's been so very hot this summer and it's going to continue to get hot. Then we're going to have to think of new ways of really utilizing old ideas uh, for keeping the buildings for our larger clients cool. If you start thinking about these wind catchers and the use of prevailing winds and such like to draw, energy, draw air down into the buildings and to use that in a way that does a natural form of cooling, then that's going to be really, really smart. And I think that we're going to have high-tech solutions meeting this ancient thinking as well going forward. So how do they work? Well, number one, air is caught by the opening of a wind catcher and funneled down into the dwelling below or the office. Air, air, air flows throughout the interior of the building, sometimes over subterranean pools of water for further cooling. Those, those pools of water, you know, the water's going to get in there somewhere. There's going to be pipe work. There's going to be a lot of infrastructure uh, and, and mechanical systems put in place for this. And warmed air will rise and leave the building through another tower or opening, aided by the pressure within the building. And we can even have mechanical systems utilized utilizing that air as it comes out for energy generation and a number of other things including maybe even growing food on roofs but we've seen this in in a modern context as well um, the uh, the the norman foster and architects uh, zenith de saint etienne uh, is a really interesting building it's incredibly distinctive it's got a cantilevered roof structure that that basically works with the wind that, that flows um, in that area that is built. It's designed to catch a, to act as a wind scoop to channel and intensify the flow of air through the building to ventilate the auditorium naturally and it reduces energy use. So it's really interesting to see this in modern architecture as well and these old ideas can really spring eternal in new places. And I really recommend uh, reading a few books on, on this kind of technology. There's one particular book by Julia Watson that came out in uh, 2020, early in 2020. It's called Low Tech. And it looks at indigenous systems around the world for food and water and energy. And it's really interesting to look at these old ways that are still being used today. And maybe we can take some inspiration into the modern world by looking backwards as well. Okay, this is all really exciting to me. And these signals are really showing us that the world's going to be different when we start to look at energy and sensor-based systems. What about smarter working? What about our use of data? Now, I've been working in data for over 30 years. And uh, when I think about data, you know, we collect that. The data is then transformed into information, knowledge, and ultimately wisdom, where we take that information, we come together, and we divine new ways and, of thinking of how uh, we can apply that. And that really feeds into our real world decision making and allows us to evaluate, research, observe and feed back into the systems and our strategies and help our clients do more. 
but our clients really do want to do more. In fact, 88% of businesses plan to adopt robotic automation. This is the dawn of artificial intelligence and robotic systems, and it's coming into our world at a great pace. Now, we can see the humanoid robots that are coming and have certainly come before us. They're not particularly useful, but uh, the, the world that we're living in is going to be having robots in a lot of different shapes working to help us. And this is about how we utilize them. So it's not necessarily artificial intelligence. It's that versus the idea of intelligence augmentation. We can use these systems to be smarter and better at our jobs, and we can work together collaboratively with robotics and systems to basically provide more value for our clients. And this is the idea of cobots or co-working robots. So you can have robots that work with us and, and we can help them uh, understand how we need to manage safety. We can guide them through certain tasks that are repetitive and they can do f things that are faster. They can take over power that we need to have ready and on hand. And when we get to that stage of utilizing these kinds of systems and in the background having artificially intelligent systems, you know, they can process data and create information automatically. That, that sort of frees us up and enables us to, to create more useful knowledge and increase the wisdom that we have. And that AI is going to do the hard work of evaluation, research, observation and feedback. And that can really help us in doing what we do for a living. But... I like to think about intelligence augmentation. Empathy, humor, creativity, and problem solving are hard to codify and automate. You can't take the human out of the ecosystem of our working world. A lot of these claims of hundreds of millions of jobs globally being destroyed by robotic process automation and artificial intelligence are overstated. At no point in history has technology destroyed huge swathes of jobs. It's just changed the landscape, and that's what we're going to see. So moving on from artificial intelligence and our augmentation into a new kind of augmentation, and that's the use of augmented realities. So these augmented realities are starting to seep into what we do for a living. The people that we work with and the architects and the designers, the engineers and the contractors are coming together to understand how things could be. One of the ways of doing that is using something called digital twins and also digital triplets. And a digital triplet uh, really puts humans into the ecosystem as well as the systems that are normally considered in digital twins. And this company, RWI Synthetics, is up in Canada and they've come up with a really interesting system where you can plug in all of your systems data and you can create representations and you can see the flow of data and information of the systems and how they're supposed to be working, the interplay of humans. And you can really play things out ahead of implementing anything. So that's done at industrial scale. We're gonna to start to see that coming into much larger industrial systems as well. But really, what's really exciting about augmented reality and, and our world is that we're heading into a place where we're going to be able to have data overlaid onto the environment. Now, this rather clumsy looking headset is from a company called Magic Leap, and this is the Magic Leap one. And if you wear this, you've got a very small field of view where you can actually see things overlaid in the world. The, the promise is big to be able to revolutionize how we see data in the world. We're no longer going to be looking at these rectangles in our pockets. We're going to be choosing reality, and these headsets are going to get smaller. In fact, we've already seen some technologies, and Microsoft has, has got a headset called the HoloLens uh, that, that are being used in places like BMW. And the engineers and the people on the, on the shop floors are, are starting to use that to help them diagnose problems and also uh, guide them in the work that they do on a daily basis. But I think that there are some tipping points coming to this technology. And I think one of the big things that's coming is a more commercially viable and wide usage of augmented reality. And uh, Facebook have got its headquarters for virtual and augmented reality in Seattle, Washington. And the, the project area that they've been working on really you know, reduces down the technology into a normal looking pair of glasses, whether that's going to be prescription or sunglasses. They're trying to get all of their billions of users to actually have access to this, to overlay that data, to be able to interact with each other, to be able to utilize data in new ways uh, within a social ecosystem. And it's very exciting. Uh, but, you know, there's some there's some dangers there around uh, surveillance and privacy. Google Glass didn't necessarily get adopted too widely in the, in the more commercial personal realm, but it's still being used in an industrial 
legal context as well. But yeah, these kinds of things are going to be commonplace, I think, within 10 years. So we're still looking a way out. It's really difficult to do hardware and to change how the physics of the eyes works with these kinds of technologies. So the signals that we've been looking at are very much based on uh, high tech and uh, what's coming, but I do think that there are some principles that come down to how we operate uh, around sustainability and resiliency. One particular big global movement right now is around the circular economy, the ability to reduce what we use, to recycle the things that are already out there in the world and to reuse uh, the resources that are available to us. Now, I've worked with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and a number of other people to think differently about how we can do that in an industrial setting. And what's interesting in the industrial setting is that we can save a huge amount of money. In fact, when we start to think about that in combination with things like sustainable development goals um, that have been proposed by the United Nations, we can start to think about combating poverty, providing uh, fresh water to more people around the world, to combating you know, drought, and we're certainly going to see that uh, in, the, in the Western US and also up in the Pacific Northwest as well, and also flooding as well. So you can apply these SDGs in a business context, actually can make you more profitable more effective and whilst you're doing something good for the planet as well. And in fact, when you start to think about the combination of circular economies and the United Nations SDGs, we can see a huge opportunity to, to grow the workforce out in the world. They think about 380 million new jobs are going to be created and about $12 trillion in business savings and value. So this does make sense. So obviously, you need to be careful about how you plan this out. There's lots of documentation out there and there's lots of people thinking big about this and consultants, I'm sure, that can help you and your business and your clients as well. But your clients are going to be wanting to adopt this. So we have to be savvy about what this means. Okay, let's think about our mechanical futures. What's the world of the mechanical contractor going to be like in 2030, 2040, 2050 and beyond? Well, we're going to see a future where we're seeing the businesses of our clients being redesigned. We're going to have to redesign how our businesses work as well. And we're going to have to think about this in a way that's smart. Now, obviously, as a futurist and a foresight practitioner, I help people look out a little bit further. But even starting to make some decisions today about uh, like applying innovations and new technologies in your business can really pay dividends in the long run. And now we've got this new ecosystem of the mechanical contractor. And we talked about intelligence augmentation. So how about using you know these cobots and these drones and the data and artificially intelligent systems and other parts of the systems to really help us be smarter than we are today? It's not saying that we're not smart. It means that we can take the data and just really exponentially grow our business, hire more people and bring them on board more quickly whilst providing clients more value.
Okay, that was a pretty fantastical video. Everything from bricklaying robots, augmented reality, and even Amazon drone blimps. Uh, that's not necessarily something that exists today, but they've got a pattern in place. But is our future going to be ruled by the technologies that we use? Are we going to be reliant on the energy to keep them going and to, to recharge batteries several times a day or to have the access to Wi-Fi? Well, I don't think we can be wholly reliant. I think these technologies can be used on occasion and we can get from one side of the city to the other. Um, we can take delivery of parts and we can uh, help ourselves uh, with cobot tasks on the work site as well. So it's occasional usage, not absolute usage and replacement. So bear that in mind. And that's because our future is very human. And that's a uh, center of the work that I do. Now, I work in strategic foresight as a futurist, and I've got a, a team of think tank members and researchers that I work with as well. And what we do is we try and help our customers really work out what their vision's going to be and how that works well for their future. Once we imagine the future, we can build a bigger vision, strengthen strategic planning, and anticipate risks today. And to do that, myself and my teams that I work with, uh, we utilize a foresight development framework, which is an umbrella framework that utilizes many different ways of thinking about the future. We ground ourselves in three key principles, humanity, not technology, plurality, inclusion and equity, scientific fact and creativity as well. And that interplay puts humans at the center of any solution and future that we can imagine. And then we look at the signals of change. And today's presentation outlined a few of the signals that I think are worth considering uh, when looking to the future of mechanical contracting. And then you can develop ideas based off of all of these solutions that are available we speculate could exist and create future narratives we can write a bigger speculative fiction as well and start to consider the different dimensions that that changes will happen in our businesses across financial organizational regulatory cultural environmental political technical and of course social dimensions as well and then we can understand what initiatives will exist 5 10 20 plus years into the future and take that evidence of these speculative unknown futures and bring it back to today and say what if the world was different and what if these things were to happen and what can we do today to strategically plan to be ready for that change coming to us and one of the one of the clients that I've worked with over the last few years has been uh, YVR Airport, Vancouver International Airport up in British Columbia. And I was very uh, proud to work with them to start to understand what their future could be. And I wrote a number of science fiction stories for them. So let's take a look at their promotional video for the public consultation that they were doing for YVR 2037. Plans for the future of YVR are taking shape. Our 2037 master plan is a blueprint for an airport that'll continue to reflect the best of BC. Sustainable, welcoming, and diverse. YVR will be a feast for the senses, a hive of activity and interaction, a business hub for entrepreneurs, and a unique retail experience that is second to none. Help shape the future of our world-class sustainable airport by attending public meetings and sharing your input online. What was interesting about that particular initiative is uh, when we launched that out, as I worked with a, a PR agency, I worked with uh, the CEO and the executive management at YVR to do their consultation for 2037. So we had four or five meetings set up to work with uh, people uh, out in the community, and we had to expand that out into uh, other cities in the in the Greater Vancouver Regional District, and also increase the number of meetings. So I think to about twelve or thirteen different meetings, huge amount of engagement, about eighteen million impressions online, and all the good stuff. And really, it came from five science fiction stories that I wrote, and we we built these visions and these short videos to really inspire people about what the future could be. And um, most exciting to me is to actually see some of those visions come to reality. So in, in, in one story, I spoke about uh, vertical forests providing food to the airport and robots uh, serving people and whatever. That's great. And look to the right. Just earlier in 2021, uh, they, they launched their glassed-in island forest with access to the outside, which kind of looks suspiciously like what we speculated could, it, could exist. In fact, looking to the future can be incredibly valuable. 
Firms that have a high future preparedness can expect an on average 33% higher profitability and a 200% higher market capitalization growth when compared to the average. And, and Rulbeck and Kum did this research over a number of years looking at dozens of companies and saw that people that did invest in foresight and did apply that to their business and had bigger visions and they strengthened strategic uh, visions of, of how they could push forward into the marketplaces and come up with new products and services really did benefit from having foresight practitioners and futurists on staff and uh, as part of their trusted partner network. So that's it. It was a short journey through a number of signals that I think are important to understand. Everything from uh, climate and how energy is changing through to sensors, artificial intelligence, our intelligence augmentation, the future of mechanical contracting and beyond. What if our world was different? What does that do to our business today and how do things change? And uh, I've written about this and, and a number of other different scenarios in, in a number of different books uh, in, in 2021. This book, The Future Starts Now, came out in Bloomsbury. I'm writing another book right now called Facing Our Futures, which looks to do planning of, of terrible futures and good futures and starting to use some opportunistic ways of thinking about how our world can change for executives and people like you. So watch out for that in fall 2022. And that's it, exponential industry. Do you think it's going to change like that? Do you think that these things are going to have a big uh, impact on the way that you do business or on the way that your clients do business as well? Well, let's get into that. Let's do a Q&A and I'm really excited to be a part of that.